Hello friends and welcome once again to our Sanctuary Church uh, online message. We are glad that you could join us. My name is Pastor Lenski as always and it is a beautiful day, sunny blue skies as I'm recording this. I don't know what it's like when you're actually watching this, but I am reminded of how good God is even in the midst of everything we're going through and it may not always feel that way, but I want us to always try to strive to remember that the momentary circumstances, as challenging as they may be and difficult, do not reflect, deny, or affect the truth of who God is, what He has done, and how He loves us. So remember that. Um, today for our message, we are actually wrapping up 1 John. We've been in 1 John for several weeks now, um, pretty much to the duration of this whole pandemic thing. And it's been encouraging to hear John speak about the church, about God, about our relationship, about clarifying the truth of Scripture and Gospel, making it easier for us to be assured and reassured of what we believe and reminded of how much we have been loved, how that love then should come out and re be reflected in how we love others. Um, it's been a tremendous journey. Pastor um, Jeff and I have been talking about how much we love this letter, and we're actually continuing after this um, and looking at John's second and third letters which are much, much shorter. Um, but for today, we are wrapping up by looking at chapter 5, starting in verse 13. So before we actually get into it, let's just read the scripture. Let's just read what we have to say. So again, in John, 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, his concluding affirmations, we read, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to His will, He will hear us. And it, if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask for in Him. If you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give them life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death, and I am not saying that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was born of God keeps them safe, and the evil one cannot harm them. We know that we are children of God, and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know that also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, so that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true by being in His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. I'm going to stop right there. There's one verse to go, but I'm going to stop right there. I love that throughout this letter, John's whole point has been to encourage, reassure, and affirm believers. It's interesting and it's always encouraging to remember that we may struggle at times now. We may look at the news and we may hear other people um, and that have different views, different opinions, different educational backgrounds, different faith or faith backgrounds, lack of faith. They may look at us in our journey with God, our belief in God, and whether it's friends or family, they may question, they may doubt, they may try to poke holes in what we believe. And that admittedly causes us to struggle. It probably does. No matter how secure we are in our faith, it is... Uh, the beauties of life recording. Um, I dropped something that I need. Ah, you gotta love it. As I was saying, one of the beauties of the things about God is that we can look at the church, we can look at the testimony, we can look at the story of things that have happened before, and they can resonate still true today. We struggle. We need reassurance. We need affirmation. We need to be reminded that the things that we believe, that the things that we follow are true, regardless of what the circumstances or other ideas or beliefs are around us. So that's what John is doing. As he's concluding his letter, he's reminding us of the things that he's been talking about through the letter so that we may continue to be assured. And what is he affirming us of? What is he reminding us of? Well, we can look at the list. Some of the assurances he gives in this last section are that we have eternal life. It is incredibly important in the Christian belief that all of the, all of the things that we're doing, all the things that we're pursuing, all the things that we believe actually lead to eternal life. Because Paul even said it. If that's not part of it, if this is all just great ideas and, and good thinking for the now, but at the end of the day, there is no eternal life, there is no next stage, Jesus didn't resurrect, then we are to be pitied because then this is all for nothing. It is okay to long for and, and think about the end result. 
and to be reminded, look, you're enduring things now, you're wrestling with things now, but it's worth it. It'll, it'll pay off because you have eternal life. Jesus Christ has paid for your sins and now has made it possible that if you believe in him, whatever happens in this world, you will reap the benefit of the blessing of having a life everlasting with God. Tremendously reassuring and affirming in the midst of whatever struggle we have. What else does it reassure us of? It reminds us that because of this, we can have confidence to go to God in prayer. What does, what does this mean? I want you to consider when he's talking about that we, because we know we have these things, we can approach God. He's talking about access. We have access to God throughout church history, throughout the Bible. A big debate in this question was, how do we access God? And the people of Israel had to access God through several rituals and, and observing several, a bunch of laws. And there was the Holy of Holies in the temple and the tabernacle. And you could only approach God if you were certain people and set aside. And access to God was very limited because of sin. His holiness and our unrighteousness just didn't mesh. But He made a way through Jesus Christ so that we have permanent open door access to the throne room of the creator of all things. Unlike other religions, unlike other aspects of life, we don't have to make an appointment. We don't have to wait for our turn. We don't have to have certain people vet us and approve us to get over the certain line or past the velvet ropes. We have access. The veil of the temple has been torn in Jesus' life-giving sacrifice and resurrection. And we now have access, not access as servants or some kind of official down the pecking order. We all have access as daughters, as sons, as children of God. That is a tremendously reassuring thing because in a world where we all have to adjust to hierarchies, if we're not the boss, if we don't have the education, if we don't have the money, in certain situations, sadly, if we are not a man or if we don't have this degree, or if we are of a certain race or a certain color, where there is such a hierarchy around us that limits what we can and cannot do. Many times, unfairly, in the kingdom of God, there is no such thing. Those barriers and those obstacles are removed and we have access to God. God himself, not God's second or third official that works as a buffer. God himself. That is tremendously, tremendously reassuring because not only do we have access, but we know that if we have access and He listens, if we ask for things that line up with His will, we have them. He will answer. It is an amazingly encouraging thing because then it does. The third thing would be that it encourages us to actually pray. In the example that he gives, we're called to pray for our brothers and sisters that are struggling with sin. And just a quick note on the idea of the sin that leads to death and sin that doesn't lead to death. Without getting on a complete theological sidetrack, I just want to reassure and comfort people that what many scholars believe and what I would tend to believe is that what he's addressing is the attitude of us towards sin and towards God. Any sin that is confessed to God and surrendered and follows a heart and an attitude of wanting to turn away from sin like we talked about before, is forgiven. And we pray for brothers and sisters struggling in that, that they may have victory in the temporary over sin. The sin that is not forgiven, whatever else we can say, is that which is unrepentant sin, a heart that chooses to not go to God, a heart that chooses to not confess, admit sin, and ask for forgiveness of sin. That state of sin, that attitude towards sin, won't be forgiven, but not because God chooses to not forgive, because we don't ask for it, and God will not give us forgiveness if we don't admit to sin. So just to clear that up, it is not about some secret unnamed sin, some action per se that you can do, and all of a sudden, once you've done it, you are not forgiven. I, I do not believe that. Many scholars do not. But just wanted to make that kind of side note. But in terms of the scripture for today, we are encouraged to pray because if, again, we have eternal life. If again, we are God's children, we're given complete access to God and we can pray anything that we want within His will, then we are encouraged to bring our prayers to Him because He listens and He will answer. Not as a magic genie that we just go in with a pray and we get whatever we want. I want a thousand dollars. I want a, I want a better job. It's not about just getting our desires met, although that can be a part of it, but it is that if we come to God with the right heart, 
seeking to live out a life and pursue the goals that He has called us to. So we are praying within His will, not in an anti-God or anti-biblical way, but aligned with it then we know that He answers. So we can pray for our brothers and sisters in sin, and He will listen. We can pray for direction and guidance on how we should live, and He will do it. We can pray for strength in in our desire to carry out His will, and He will do it. He will provide and care for us. So we pray. So we are encouraged to pray because we are affirmed that He will listen. We are assured of it. The other thing that we're assured of is that He protects and He cares for His people. He talks about it right there. In this world, the enemy has a certain place, the battle is real, but we are assured that he will protect us, he will fight for us. The scripture puts it this way, again, I will read it again. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who is born of God is kept, the born of God keeps them safe and the evil one cannot harm them. Now, we know this, he said it, we talked about it last week. In this world, you will have trouble. We are assured that there will be trouble. So when he talks about no harm, It does not mean that you will never get sick, that you will never struggle, that you will never be hurt, that you will never have difficult, challenging circumstances. That is not what it means. In this fallen world, until the Lord's return and the culmination of all His promises and the entering into His eternal reign, we will have trouble. But where the enemy may try to harm us eternally, He will not be able to because we have eternal life. He protects us. He keeps us. He guides us. He he sets a hedge of protection around us that says, there is only so much that will be able to happen. And through that, I will carry them. Through that, I will equip them and I will strengthen them. And ultimately, I will keep them safe and give them life. It makes us, it should reflect on us that then when we look at our circumstances, whatever it looks like, it will not crush us. It will not pulverize, defeat, ultimately win over us. No matter what it looks like, the victory is the Lord's, and in Him we have victory. So those four assurances are a tremendous thing, a tremendous thing. Now, what I want to focus on today as we clo- as we get to the close of the message is how He closes the letter. After saying all these things... After talking about God's love, His love for us, our love for people, after He surmises and and reiterates and reminds us of the things that we are affirmed and assured of, He closes with one line. One line. Verse 21. Dear children, keep yourself from idols. I don't know if that seems weird to you, but it seems like a kind of, not anticlimactic, but kind of a weird way to end. After all these assurances, all these promises, you feel like that command could have maybe either been put earlier or just not addressed because you want to finish with a rallying cry. He loves you. He's got you. You are God's children. You will not, sin will not have victory over you. He protects you. It seems like, almost like a line that he forgot. Oh, and by the way, don't, don't have idols in your life. But it's not quite that. It's a very, actually, appropriate way to finish out the letter. Because from the beginning, we've said that the whole reason he's writing is he he wants to reassure Christians at the time, the church at the time, about their foundation of what they believe that it is true. There are other groups claiming that what the Christians were believing was not true or that it needed modified, debating whether Jesus was actually fully God or fully human, debating the foundations of the faith. And John is saying, look, 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 be reassured in what you know. Your faith and your foundation is set on what is true and therefore have confidence. What if that is not a call to put your faith in God and nothing else? To not let other beliefs, other things, other people challenge what you believe and what you put your faith on. That is what an idol is. So we have to ask, again, how does that apply to us? What is an idol? We know that in John's time, there were very physical things, statues, monuments, things that men had done, put together and crafted out of wood, out of iron, out of gold, and made that they had decided those were the representations of their gods. Those were the things they were going to put their faith in. They were going to pray and devote themselves in action and deed to these deities, to these man-made things. But an idol was more than a, than a thing. There are many things that can become an idol. There are many things that can be take that place. And And they apply to us today as well. Because while I would imagine most of you don't have 
corners in your house where there's a statue of something that you pray to every day and that you put your faith and hope in. We do have a lot of things that fit that description. Timothy Keller, in one of his books about this very subject, put it this way, anything that is more important to you than God, anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God, anything you seek to give you what only God could give, that is the definition of an idol. Now, when you read it in that context, I will admit for me that really hits home because I would like to say, I don't have any idols, God. Look at my home. No statues, no weird paintings, no weird habits and sacrifices to other kinds of things. No, I have no idols. Then I analyze my life. I saw somebody else do this, especially during this quarantine time. And when I think of, is there anything that's more important to me than God? Anything that is absorbing my heart and my imagination or calling me more than God? Is there anything that I seek to give me the things that only God could give? Well, like what? Comfort, peace, reassurance, satisfaction, value. So I start thinking about those things, especially during quarantine, then the picture becomes a little less favorable. <laughs> I came up with this thing. I see some. I saw somebody else do it. Um, let's think of idols. We know idols in terms of like, you know, American Idol and other kinds of like shows and things like that. So let's think of idols from the perspective of our COVID-19 quarantine idol. It's a long, drawn-out game, but as I think of my own, what I see is, ah, Netflix is pretty high up there. Junk food, comfort food comes into play. Um, physical activity, getting outside, or, or, or these things. Now, why do I call those idols? Am I worshiping them? Do I have altars set up to these things? Are there cupcakes put on pedestals with shining lights, directional lights on them that I come to every night? Oh, Lord of the cupcake, give me strength. Well, no, obviously not. And I assume it's not that way for you either. But when you think of the definition um, Keller provides, I know that at the end of most days, after a stressful day of parenting, of work, of dealing with isolation, of dealing with the worries and concerns of this day and age and the things that are happening, more often than not, I don't go, what's going to get me through this is if I have a really good prayer time and I go to Scripture. No, oftentimes it's, man, I can't wait to go binge on that new series that I've been working through while I soothe my nerves with some junk food and then plan out my next day to get out because I need some mental health and I need to get out and hit the trail or ride my bike or do something. This is the tricky thing about idols. None of the things I mentioned in, in measure are bad. They're not sin. I mean, I don't know what you're watching and stuff, but they're not sin within measure, within self-control, within reason. They're just things. No negative, positive value per se. But when we allow them to take places in our hearts that should only be for God, they become idols. When we are more stressed about things that don't matter to God, so I'll throw in other things. Money, good looks, job position or, or promotions how our house looks, what kind of house we have. When these kind of things take up more of mental and heart real estate than God. When we look to other things to define us and give us peace and give us security. When we look at our circumstances and think, what's going to get me through this isn't God. It's how much money I have in the bank. Or how much I've worked out and how physically fit I am. Or how many degrees I have. When we look at our life and we say, what's going to get me through this isn't God and Scripture and the truth of that I gain through prayer and time with Him, but it's going to be just disconnecting through TV or media or social, you know, social uh, Facebook and things like that. It's going to be video games. It's going to be junk food or baking or eating, just eating in general. When we put those things in those places, they have a tendency to become idols. John is saying, John is reminding us all that you believe about God, if you've heard the truth, is the truth. Put your foundation in that. And if that is your foundation, then God is the primary. He is the one that loves you. He is the one that equips you to be able to love others. He is the one that has called you. He is the one that keeps you safe. He is the one that provides. Don't share that space with anything else. Idolatry is actually a huge problem in Scripture, and one of the things that God speaks out against the harshest, oft, often, over and over again, 
Just to give you some examples, in the Ten Commandments, one of the original things, and in Leviticus, God puts it this way, do not make idols or set up an image or a sacred stone for yourselves. Do not place carved stone in your land to bow down before it. I am the Lord your God. Again, it may not be carved stones and images in our case, but the message is clear. Don't have idols. Don't worship. Don't pursue. Don't let anything else become primary in your life. I am the Lord your God. The Bible talks about how God is a jealous God. And in His jealousy, it's righteous, duly worth jealousy. Like, He can be jealous because He is God. In Exodus 23... He says that again, you shall have no other gods before me. And before me can even be deceiving because in before me, we get get this picture and idea of a hierarchy. Okay, so no other gods before me. But but, But I can have other things just as long as they're not more than God. And that gets us into a tricky game of measuring out. I had a friend of mine that had a chart. And he addressed it this way. If I want to engage in this many hours of online gaming or online binge watching or shows and stuff, then I have to make sure that the amount of time I've spent with God is greater than. Now that sounds well and good, but the tendency, think of your kids. We always find that line and we want to say, how far can I push it without offending God? How long can I stay out past curfew or how much can I push curfew so that I don't get in trouble? How much of this bad food can I eat before I actually get sick? How much can I put off my work without actually becoming negligent or not having trouble. How much can I get with, get away with, with loving my wife, the minimum, getting flowers? Like how much is enough where I don't have to ex- overextend myself and it still be okay? We're always looking for the boundary of getting ourselves room to get away with stuff rather than going, how is the farthest, what is the farthest I can do to show this person I love them, to show that I'm a good worker, to show that I'm a good husband, a good father? What is the most I can possibly do without exhausting myself or just falling dead or just neglecting other things? When we measure our idolatry by how much can I get away with before offending God, the focus is on us, not on God. It's on how can we get or how much do we have to not lose? How, how, how can we get away without losing as much as possible? When the concern should be, How much of God can I get in my life? How much can I do, say, and act? How much can I cut out of my life to make sure that God knows that He is the first and primary thing in my life? Now listen, I am giving us the biblical ideal, but I know that it's hard. So I'm not saying cancel all your subscriptions, throw out all the junk food in your house. I'm not, again, those things aren't evil. And God doesn't want us necessarily to follow Him by it just being that we abstain from everything. He wants us to wrestle with what it means to choose Him above other things. And He will give us the strength to do so and bless us for our efforts. So my encouragement to you this week is this. Look at your life. Look at the things you're doing, the things you're not. And just engage in a conversation with God and go, do I have idols in my life? And if I do, how do we want me to deal with them? For some of us, it may be, you need to get rid of that, at least for a season. For others, it may be, no, you just need to cut back and this is an opportunity for you to seek me more. The journey can be very revealing and very encouraging if you would only invite him into it and submit to him. So my prayer for you, my prayer for me, is that we would be willing to lovingly and humbly examine our lives through the lens of Christ by his spirit to examine where the idols are. And rather than feel shame and guilt, which is what the enemy would want us to do, that we may then gladly go, thank you, Lord, for showing me this. Now, help me figure out how do I deal with it? How do I put you in the right place so that these things are not competing or infringing on our relationship and on our time together? Because that is the most important thing. I want my heart to seek after you. I want nothing to compete for my heart except for you. You are what satisfies. You are what provides what I need. I'm going to close today by reading from Psalm 115. What I want you to do is just consider what it's saying in light of what we've talked about, in light of what John has said. And I would invite you to just listen to it and consider how it could apply to your life. Afterwards, I will close like I do in prayer and then we'll do the Lord's Prayer. But I want you to be encouraged. Remember the things we've read about in this letter, how loved you are, what God has done, what He's called you to, what the truth of the gospel is. 
and that nothing compares to it. And ultimately, what we want to say is that there is no one like our God. There is no idol. There is no thing. There is no media, no food, no activity, no degree, no relationship, nothing that compares to God and the impact He has in your life and He wants to have in your life, how much He loves you and cares for you and how much He wants to provide for you. Nothing compares to God. With that in mind, I invite you to close your eyes or follow along. Like I said, I'm going to read from Psalm 115. And it says, Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to Your name be the glory, because of Your love and because of Your faithfulness. Why do the nations say, Where is their God? Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases Him. But their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. Eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but cannot hear. Noses, but cannot smell. They have hands, but cannot feel. Feet, but cannot walk. Nor can they either uh, utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them. And so will all who put their trust in them. All you Israelites, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. House of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. You who fear Him, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. The Lord remembers us and will bless us. He will bless His people, Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, small and great alike. May the Lord cause you to flourish, both you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The highest of heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to mankind. It is not the dead who praise the Lord, those who go down into the place of silence. It is we who extol the Lord, both now and forevermore. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Oh, what a tremendously encouraging thing that we can trust you. The world may look around and doubt our faith, doubt its validity, doubt the Bible, call us crazy, questions, want to reform and redefine what belief in God is and come up with new fancy ways of approaching God that are not true, that are not in keeping with Scripture. And they may question us. We may feel insecure. We may doubt, we may fear, but we are reminded and encouraged that no, our God is true and real and He reigns from heaven. All authority is His. All those other things are false idols. Things that sound appealing, things that look appealing, things that promise the things that we want, but they are vain, they are empty, and they are false and will produce nothing. For those of us that remain true, for God's people in Israel, for the house of Aaron, and for us, those that fear the Lord, that applies to all believers throughout history, including us. Those that fear the Lord, we have a promise that He watches over us, that He will bless, that He will help us to flourish, that He will watch, that He will provide for us. We are called to trust in the Lord because in Him all our needs are met. Idols are false and empty and provide nothing. God is greater. There is no one greater than our God. So we trust in Him and we praise You. We praise You, God, for that. Remind us of that this week as we wrestle with what our idols might be. Help us to not be afraid of it, not to fear, but to rejoice in the fact that You want to point out those things in our life so that we may correct them through your strength and your help and that we may enjoy the full blessing of having you enthroned in our hearts above everything else with no competition, no comparison. A life completely submitted and surrendered to you where you reign supreme and you are first in all things is a life that is blessed with all that we need. Thank you for your assurances. Thank you for your affirmations, for eternal life, for unlimited access to the throne room, for the power of prayer that you answer, for the protection that you offer us as we battle the evil one. May we respond by loving you and loving you to the point of giving you everything and letting nothing take your place. Strengthen us, equip us. And Lord, again, we praise you for all that you are, all that you've done and what you continue to do. It is in your name we pray and we close now by reciting the words that you have taught us to center our hearts and our minds in what is true and what is important. As we recite the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the Lord bless you. Have an amazing week. Enjoy the weather wherever it's nice. And when it's not, still praise the Lord for all the things He has done because He is good and He is faithful. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He loves you more than anything. And He wants you to experience that love by keeping Him first in your life. Have a wonderful day. God bless you. And we'll see you guys next time.